Simply describe what an operating system is. So that's one answer. Uh, at the end of class, I'll show you kind of my attempt to tell uh, to explain what an operating system is in a four-minute YouTube video. Uh, there's also an assigned reading that has a number of good points, uh, some of which we'll talk about it today. And Another way to think about an operating system is it's just a very large program. So the Linux operating system, open source, more than 15 million lines of code in that operating system. Uh, and that's small for an operating system. Windows has many, many more uh, lines of code than that. So why would we study an operating system? There are a few reasons. The first is you know how stuff works. So an operating system is going to underlie almost everything that a computer system does. So if we want to understand how a computer system actually works, we need to understand the operating system. Second, there are a lot of interesting problems. and corresponding interesting and elegant solutions that an operating system has to confront. And so as part of a computer science education, we're just generally interested in interesting problems and their solutions, and operating systems is a great place for that. And finally, Going through our 10 weeks of talking about operating systems together, it's going to be a step towards a real and comprehensive understanding of a computer system. All right, so that's why we're here. That's what we're driving for. So let's talk about some background. So, right there. Okay, so. One important piece of background that you may remember from CS208 I realize now that I didn't say my name is Aaron. Uh, I will be your, your pilot for operating systems uh, this term. Uh, I know, I believe I have have most, but not all of you, in CS208, so hello again. Um, all right, so one important thing, a piece of background is our li the life cycle of a program. So when we want run a program, what happens? There's basically two steps uh, in this kind of high-level overview. First, we need to load the program, which on a typical system means taking the bytes of the program from disk 
and putting them into memory. When I take them off the disk, put them into memory, uh, you should recall that accessing memory is a lot faster than accessing the disk. So if we're going to be doing our next step, of executing our loaded program, which breaks down into actually a kind of loop of three different steps. The first is we want to fetch the next instruction to execute from memory to our CPU. We then need to decode the bytes of that instruction to figure out what instruction it is, what are the steps the CPU needs to do to then be able to execute it. And so this step fetch, if each instruction, we didn't have this load, each instruction we were going to the disk, that's going to be a big problem because the disk is very slow. And if we want our CPU to be fetching instructions very fast, to be able to run our programs very fast, we would want this first step to put our program into memory. So have this kind of fetch to code execute that we go through uh, to, to run our program. And this is on the level of individual instructions. So 208, we study x86 assembly. Different CPUs may use different instruction set architectures, but this kind of fetch to code execute on the level of instructions. Any questions about this so far? bit more of remember uh, your CS208. One is we're going to be doing C programming in this course. All of our uh, labs in the final project will be in C. So uh, there are some uh, resources for C linked from the course website. So those will be uh, good for you to consult as, as you work on this, and the other is we want to keep in mind where our data and code live in memory. And so as a way to review, let's consider following C code. We have a function that I've called funct, takes in an integer and it adds one to that integer. And then we declare an integer and call our function with y as an argument. So what I'm interested in is where is y in memory, where is func in memory, and where is x in memory, and are x and y the same or, or different when we call func. So I'll give you two, take a couple minutes, uh, turn to your neighbors, talk about where these things are living in memory, what's going to happen when we run this code. Okay. So, let's first name some, some regions of memory, some kind of regions of memory that are used for specific purposes. Who can uh, uh, The top of the stack, where all the stuff is, the variables, instant variables, yeah. Top of the stack. <laughs> we have a, a stack. Uh, it has variables. Uh, anything else that we keep on the stack? Sorry. We also have the heap. Oh, it's also like return addresses on the stack. Yeah, we have return addresses, and in general, what we'll call the function context, the stack string. So every time we call a function, information that we need for 
executing and returning from that function uh, may show up on the stack. All right, we have the have the heap. Uh, what's notable about the heap? What is it? What is it used for? Here, something we develop, like some global. Uh, so, malloc is the function we use to allocate dynamic memory. So, everything that we're doing on the stack, that's predetermined. Kind of at compile time, we know what's going to be on the stack because the nature of uh, our code is going to tell us that. Our dynamic memory memory that we allocate as the program is running, almost as needed, maybe in response to user input, maybe in response to uh, a request coming in from the network. This we need to be able to do dynamically, and we have malloc as the uh, C function for that. Any other regions of code? Yeah. Uh, the place where we store like all of the preloaded functions. It's like func, or like what func does will be so much. Yeah, our code, there's going to be a region of memory that's specifically for storing the instructions of the program that we're running. And uh, they would also mention uh, global variables, which will have their own section of memory. We, these are also things that we know at compile time. There are some variables that have been declared as global variables, and those some space will be reserved for those in a specific section of memory. Uh, any other regions of memory? There's one more that may be the least important. But literal values, like uh, if you see actual text appear in double quotes in a C program, we call a string literal. Those will actually go in their own section of memory. Basically, an, a, a, the equivalent of an immutable global variable. So we have these regions of memory. Now let's think about okay, where do these uh, different values that I've circled in green here, where do they live in memory? How about why? Is something? Yeah, this is a variable that kind of is declared in the code. We know that whatever function this code, uh, what it, whatever, uh, uh, so this is y will appear um, uh, in the stack. If this int y is not inside any function, like as I've written here, there's not a function around this, y if it's not inside a function, it's not going to go on the stack, because the stack's just for stuff uh, that, that functions do. So where would where would we put y if it's outside of any function? Yeah. Also in the stack. Yeah. Oh, oh, on the front. Uh, yes, it would be a global variable if it's declared outside of any function. How about func? If we were looking at, okay, what region is func itself stored in? What's that going to be? Style? Is that good? Yep, it's going to be made up of instructions, so we're going to keep it in, it will be loaded into the code section of memory. And finally, x. All right. Yeah, this is a local variable and a function, so it would be on the stack. Uh, is this variable necessarily in memory at all? No. Why not? Because it may or may not even get called or exist. So maybe our function isn't called, but let's say it is called. When we call func, is our variable necessarily actually put into memory. Yeah. I think also be directly stored. Yeah. So apart from memory, our CPU has registers. Fic a fixed number, 16 of them, 64 byte 
registers. And when a function is called, typically the arguments to that function are passed via the register. So the specific register holds the first argument, the specific register holds the second, and so on. And so this being an integer, and we're not doing anything that requires it to have an address, and so it's very likely it will just be in a register and won't actually ever show up in memory at all. What are your questions on this? All right. So let's consider now, uh, with this background out of the way, a picture where we have some application running on a computer system, and Underneath that application is the operating system. And underneath the operating system is the hardware, the actual uh, electronic components that form our computer system. So our operating system is sitting between uh, what we'll call user applications and the hardware. So with this sort of simplified picture in mind. I'd again like you to discuss with your neighbors what are some functions, what are some things we need the operating system to do as it sits between our user application and our hardware? What does this part of the computer system, what sort of things does it need to, to provide or, or accomplish? All right, what's something we want the operating system to do? Schedule tasks. And can you say a bit more what you mean by schedule? Uh, manage the limited resources of the computer to run uh, all the different processes that are turned around. And also, in the direct sense, run things that have passed to be run at a certain time. Yeah, the operating system needs to decide what runs. Because we may be in a situation, as my laptop is in right now, where there's a web browser that's displaying stuff to me, there is Panopto, which is connected to these devices here and is recording. Uh, that it, as it's recording, it's writing a file to the disk of the uh, computer. There is uh, right now a couple kilobytes being uploaded and downloaded on the network as various applications talk to things on the internet. And so all these things are happening uh, from my perspective simultaneously. And it's the case that even if our computer, even if this laptop had only one CPU, it has several, but even if it only had one, the OS would be responsible for deciding what runs when. One way to see the importance of this is if I went to my laptop and I wrote the very exciting C program While true, if this program was run directly on the hardware, the only way I could get it to stop would be to remove the battery or just let it run out of power. Because there would be, the CPU would be entirely taken up by doing this loop. And without this operating system in between, there would be nothing to decide, okay, enough of this, it's now someone else's turn to use the CPU. So scheduling. Uh, a very, very important um, requirement. Uh, how long is going to be How and where to store data, critical function of the operating system. In this picture here, where 
is the data store. It's in the hardware, right? The, the memory, the disk, all this stuff is in the hardware. We have those operating systems sitting between an application that might want to read a file, might want to update some value in memory. All of these things to get to where all the data is stored pass through the operating system. Why might we want to do this? Because it's not free. If this application could directly access the disk in memory, we do a little less work because it's not, we, we don't get to pass through the operating system with kind of no, no overhead. So why might we want the operating system to do this, Cash? Oh, because if you open up two programs and they both try to get the same memory, then they'll just keep overwriting each other without an operating system to coordinate them. Exactly. We want the operating system to be able to act as a referee, to be able to handle allocating the resources of this hardware among maybe multiple applications. And this is a huge part of the operating system's job. That we have all these applications up here, uh, hungry, hungry applications. They just want all the resources. No, no, no. And if we let them do that, we'd be sad. So instead, we have the operating system acting as a referee deciding where and how to allocate uh, memory for storing data or access to the hard drive or, or any other resource on our system. Here. Would security kind of like be a part of that, or is it a, that it's separate thing? So security is an excellent uh, point. And security is going to uh, basically be part of all the functions that we want an operating system to do. Uh, we want the operating system's decision about what to run to be protected against malicious programs that try and consume all the resources on the system. Same with how it's handing out memory and so on. The operating system needs to be robust, needs to be able to handle if anything some mustachioed evil application might try and do. So when implementing or designing an operating system, we basically always need to think of the application as a kind of mustache twirling villain. Like they are out to get us and we need to be ready for any bizarre or malicious thing that they might do. Other things in operating system we would want. Right. Do you want to remember, like tell the CPU what to do? Like tell it to like you know tell the hardware just like to do stuff? Like control the hardware, I guess. Yeah. yeah, we want our operating system to control the hardware. And one kind of example of why uh, controlling the hardware might be a really useful thing for the operating system to do, apart from the sort of security reason where we don't want the application to be able to just do whatever they want, is let's say uh, we have an application that is going to play music. Well, there are hundreds of different sound cards out there, hundreds of different devices that might be in a laptop or a PC that produce sound. And if the application developer had to write special purpose code for each of those hundred different sound cards, then developing an application for this system becomes incredibly difficult and bug prone because you have to handle a huge range of different devices. So instead, we punt that responsibility to the operating system. And inside the operating system, we have what are called drivers or device drivers, basically programs that describe how to interact with a particular hardware device. And so a given operating system comes with a large number of drivers for kind of all the different uh, sound cards that it might expect that it will need to work with. 
and if it doesn't have a driver, I might need to install a new one. But this is what is uh, describing how to interact with the hardware, and so our applications only have to interact with Each of our applications will have a system library that is part of the application, which is just a uniform set of functions that the application uses to ask the OS to do things. So there'll be, from the application's perspective, kind of one consistent function it can use to ask the operating system to play a sound. And then the operating system will have loaded in whatever driver corresponds to the actual sound card in the hardware. And so this one system library function will kind of route to the appropriate driver and down into the hardware. Does that make sense? Questions on it? Wait, so does each app have its own system library, or they're all just integrating the same system library? That's, uh, so it's the same system library. Right, that she is And so I have kind of drawn it because the system library is uh, linked to each application. Uh, but that's a good point. Do they all have their own separate copy, or are we being kind of, do we, do we need to copy this library that is the same for all applications? No, so the way that the operating system will manage the, the memory for these system libraries is that they'll all just refer to the same kind of one copy of these system library functions. Okay. So when an app doesn't run on a particular operating system, is that because like there's some implementation that it doesn't provide in the system library that the app wants? Or like, why, why can't the OS just like tell the apps, Here, here's all the stuff we can do, and then it just works on every operating system? Yeah, so, uh, so a good point. Why can't we just write an app once and it runs everything? So this comes down to this system library piece. So how you ask Linux to read or write a file is different from how you ask Windows to read or write a file. It's different from how you ask Mac to read and write a file. And so with the same, so with a given set of code, it either needs to determine what operating system it, it's on and then use the appropriate uh, system call, or we need different versions of our application that use the correct Kind of interface for whatever operating system that we're running on. Uh, it's also the case that uh, not only are we concerned with operating system, but we also need to take into account the architecture, whether it's x86 or ARM uh, or MIPS, kind of what the instruction set architecture is. The program will need to have been compiled for to use into the correct instruction for whatever CPU it's running on. One way around this is you use something like Java, where Java is another, the, the Java virtual machine is another layer that sits between applications and the OS, and all the applications just talk to Java, and then there are different versions of the Java virtual machine that have been implemented for different, different operating systems and architectures. Does that make sense? Are the operating systems so different that you can't just have like a little translator that just turns whatever your app is and says, okay, here's all, all the different calls you need to make for this OS versus this OS? So if it were the case that the operating systems give you all the kind of equivalent functions and just named them something different, okay. <laughs> then sure, you could translate it. But unfortunately, that's not the case. There, there are like different ways these these things work, different sorts of return values, all that. Yes. Well, the same thing with like how the system drops and what the drop is what how you use that system to read the code. Yes, so you can you can with a lot of work implement this sort of translation. Um, or yes, Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, very handy, maybe five years old at this point. Uh, basically lets you run Linux and translates everything to have Windows do it. Um, so it's kind of, you're running Linux, and then you have the Windows subsystem for Linux, and then you have Windows underneath that. The new Apple M1 machines, that's not an x86 architecture, but 
they implemented a kind of layer that you can run an x86 application and it will translate it uh, uh, into, into the appropriate ML instruction. So you can write these, but it's not a simple kind of press a button and you take source code and, and turn it into source code for some different OS. Other questions? All right. So a bit of an aside, doing a uh, presidential fact break. So I've decided this term uh, to uh, talk about in chronological order my estimation of the uh, least well-known presidents. So we're going from Martin Van Buren the eighth. We have 28 lectures, so we'll cover 28 presidents from Van Buren onward. So. Uh, long career in, in politics. This is a, a picture from when he was he was president. Uh, he was uh, elected in uh, 1830, 1836 and served as vice president and secretary of state under Andrew Jackson and as governor of New York uh, before that and as uh, many offices in New York before that. Uh, he is our uh, one of our presidents with the most magnificent facial hair. Um, makes me kind of wish that uh, they were called like Siberians rather than Siberians. Uh, they are actually named for this guy. You can do it, Ambrose Burnside. So they were called Burnside and it became Siberians. Uh, to him as a, a general in, in the Civil War. But uh, a little more about Van Buren. Uh, he was a, a kind of a founding member of the Democratic Party, which kind of came about when uh, Andrew Jackson uh, was elected. And uh, he was not a very popular or particularly successful president. Uh, his first year in office saw a massive economic panic. Uh, in this time, it's hard to conceive of, but the U.S. did not issue any paper money. The only paper currency was just individual banks could print paper currency and be like, you can redeem this for gold or silver at the bank. And so if people got nervous that the bank wasn't doing so well, they'd rush to the bank to exchange the paper money for the gold or silver coins. Um, eventually, after numerous economic panics uh, in the early 20th century, the U.S. created the Federal Reserve System, which, and there's never been another economic crash since then, so <laughs> it seems to have worked wonderfully. Uh, Van Buren also uh, continued uh, Andrew Jackson's uh, Indian removal program, which I think correctly is seen as uh, horrific injustice today, uh, and there were uh, wars in, in Florida uh, during his term as the, the U.S. Army tried to, to force people from their land. All right, so next, uh, next class, look forward to the ninth president, but that's our, our presidential uh, interlude. So, uh, want to bring up a couple uh, terms uh, for what we've talked about uh, with these issues here. Uh, a lot of this relates to virtualization, which is the idea that our uh, computer might have one CPU and one kind of finite physical memory, and the operation operating system is making this seem like many CPUs many large or uh, large and private memories. So we have kind of some physical resources, but we are virtualizing them, meaning that we're kind of giving the uh, illusion of each running process has its own CPU, each running process has its own large private memory. And uh, this also relates to how physical memory is actually shared. Uh, the operating system is 
is dividing that up. And so the talked about the operating system is referee. This is the operating system is illusionist. It is presenting the uh, mean illusions to our uh, uh, to our applications and this kind of system library uh, and drivers that prevent it uh, that kind of help all of our applications kind of work with this nice clean interface. That is the operating system is glue. It's kind of holding uh, the parts of the system together. All right. What are we doing? Uh, so there are a few uh, demonstrations. Kind of illustrate uh, these concepts we've been we've been talking about. So uh, first is. Uh, this uh, is this text large enough for everyone to see? Great. Uh, so this program here, it expects kind of two. Uh, it expects a, a string on the command line when we when we run it, and all it's going to do is print that string and then wait for one second, and this spin. Uh, one is this function here, where uh, we get the time and we just sit in this while loop until that much time, uh, until kind of one second has passed. So, uh, with this kind of simple CPU program, uh, we can, uh, if we just Run with the letter A, it will print out A once a second. That all seems good. Now, if I run CPU A and CPU B, and CPU C, and follow each of these commands with an ampersand, this tells Linux to start that process and then put it in the background. So I'm basically starting three of these CPU programs at once, where each of them is going to be sitting in this while loop uh, for one second and then printing out the letter. I see ABC, ABC, ABC. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to keep printing ABC because these are all running in the background. So I have to tell it, uh, please fill all processes named CPU. There are a bunch that include CPU in the name that I'm not allowed to kill, which is good. That would make the Mantis server very sad, but uh, I did manage to uh, get rid of them. And I can run each of these commands. Now, this is on this Mantis CS server, which, uh, if we look, has uh, 28 uh, CPUs. In it. So the fact that we can have three things going at once maybe isn't that exciting. We have a lot of CPUs that can each kind of have their own CPU that way. But I want to show you that using this task set uh, command, we can tell Linux to restrict a process to only a particular set of processes. And so before each of these CPU, I say task set that C1. I'm saying each of these can only run on CPU 1. So they're all going to be sharing the same CPU. And this is just to demonstrate that we still see ABC, 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 maybe in different orders. But all three are kind of getting a turn to run on this single CPU. Questions on that? David. Kind of unrelated. What are the little numbers? Like you have like the two, three, four, and then some numbers afterwards. What are those? Uh, down here. And, and also at the top, they're the same. Yeah. So this two, three, four are. It's telling me that okay, background task number two has process ID seven one nine one. Background task number three is process ID seven one nine. So it's just printing out information about these processes I'm putting into the background. 
Other questions? So like the fact that they are not fencing like in a complex manner, because like they have like the uh, operating system to like manage it, but they bring the ABC to like A, A, B, C, A, B, something like that. Yeah, so, so the thing to take away from this is this is virtualization in action. I ran three programs, all of which just sit in a while loop. And so if there wasn't an operating system deciding what gets to run when, then one of them would get to sit in this while loop, and the other is wouldn't ever print anything, because they'd never get a turn until I stopped the first. But the operating system, in its role as referee, is doing the scheduling. It is switching kind of which of these three processes gets to run on the CPU, so they all get a turn, and so they're all printing out once a second. Right. So if you instead make it just while true, instead of, instead of once a second, Will the total numbers of times each of them have run, how, how do they diverge? Do they quickly diverge? Like... Uh, that would be an interesting uh, test. Code will be on the website if you, if you want to play around with that. Um, if, so you're saying if we have an infinite loop and then other things that are... Yeah, if you've got two infinite loops, like in between... Two programs, I mean. Well, I mean, if they're, if they're infinite loops, then they'll both print out once, enter the infinite loop, and then neither will print out anything again. If they're producing output in that infinite yeah, loop, yeah. Uh, I think, yes, you'll see kind of a, their output interleaved, and unless you limit the rate, it's going to kind of swamp. Oh. Uh, but yes, it will do some switching between them, but there's no guarantee that they each get an equal gotcha. change loop there. When we talk about Scheduling the different algorithms, different policies the operating system might use to deal with things like fairness or uh, to avoid one program that never gets to run, things like that. All right, another example is uh, getting at kind of how what we were talking about with these regions of memory. Uh, if I actually I should show you the program. I have this mem.c, and it takes in a number, and we have a global variable that's an integer, and then we have a pointer to an integer, p, and we have a point to this global variable. So we're getting the address, the location in memory where a global variable is stored, and putting that memory address in the variable p, and then in this loop, wait one second, add one, to our global variable using this pointer p. So dereference the pointer, we go to where it points to the memory of our global, global variable, add one to it, and we're just printing out its new value each time. And so we run this once, we see that we have the address of our main function, that's our code region of memory, we have our address of p, it's a local variable, it's on the stack, and we have the address stored in p, which is our global variable. And we see it's you know, just adding one to our global variable each time, not that exciting. But if I run uh, mem twice, two different processes, both have a global variable, both have a pointer to that global variable, both adding one to it, we can see that the address stored in P is the same for both of these processes. So both of them believe the global variable to be at the same address. But if we see the numbers, we see 1, 7, 2, 8, 9, 4, 10, 5. The globe, they're not interfering with each other. They each have these separate global variables despite thinking that the global variables are at the same address. And that's our operating system taking the accesses to memory that these applications and figuring out where in the actual physical memory they correspond to. So this is, before we saw virtualization of the CPU, this is virtualization of memory. We actually have only one memory. These global variables are in two separate places. But each running program is getting the view that it has its own memory, that it's the only one using it. Please stop.
Questions on that? Oh. So it was five, but the first one printed was seven for the second one. Uh, I think it printed six. Oh, it printed six at the top. Okay. Yeah, it was just when you're running in the background, the prints get mixed in with with uh, other. Yeah. So if you had like two storage drives, does virtualization also like combine them into one? And even though like they would each like if, if, say you have two, you know, identical terabyte storage drives, like they would each have an address 6020AC, right? But the OS would like give them each different virtual addresses also? Yeah, so uh, we should be uh, kind of specific uh, in that we have kind of two types of storage typically. We have memory or volatile storage requires electricity to maintain data with access is relatively fast, and we have disk, which non-volatile maintains uh, uh, what's stored there even when it doesn't have an electric current, but it's pretty slow. So our operating system will typically have, uh, our, our memory might be divided up into separate like physical memory sticks, kind of separate electric components. Those will all be uh, viewed as kind of one big chunk of memory that the operating system deals with. For disks, it's a little more complicated. Um, for disks, you can set them up, and uh, typically they would be separate. Uh, uh, but there is, uh, and we'll get to this at the, the very end of the term, there are ways to configure multiple disk drives so that they kind of uh, appear as a single uh, disk drive that maybe replicates uh, its contents on other disks in order to be uh, robust to one of them here. But typically, disks will be separate memory altogether. Other questions? All right, one, uh, uh, one uh, more uh, demo. Uh, and that is a program that does uh, a pretty basic input output. So we have this do work function. It uses this open function, which is a system call. It's part of that system library. It's a function defined by the Linux operating system. And so we're saying open uh, a file in the slash TMP, the temp directory, call it file, uh, make it so that you can read and write it, read it if it doesn't exist, if it does exist, overwrite it, so truncate it to a file with no contents. Uh, and so this is how we're providing these arguments to this uh, system library uh, uh, function. Gives us back an integer, which identifies the file that we just opened, and FD because it's called a file descriptor, more on this on Friday. We have an array of characters. We write to that array of characters the string hello world and a new line. And then we write the contents of that character array to our file. Print the number of bytes that we successfully wrote. F-sync makes sure that any contents that has that we've told the operating system to write to that file actually gets written, because the operating system is allowed to delay that. Doesn't have to do it immediately. Um, and then we close the file. So here we see uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and at most six of these uh, of these calls. But we can use a program called strace to show us all the system calls that are actually made to the operating system while the program runs. So I say strace and run IO. And we see that it actually does quite a lot of system calls just to do this simple start a program, open a file, write a string to it, close the file. Now most of these 
take place before we even get to opening the file. So most of these relate to just starting up a, uh, a process and providing it with memory. This exec VE is how we actually start this I.O. program running. And then it's checking whether certain uh, files exist that might signal how this program should be run. Uh, it loads a threading library and the C library. This mmap is uh, a kind of dynamic memory allocation. Uh, we're familiar with malloc, but maybe not with mmap. We will get familiar with mmap. But it's a way to uh, take a whole chunk of memory and make it available for the process. And eventually, we finally get down to opening our temporary file, writing hello world to that file, and then writing the wrote 12 bytes, the thing that we're printing out, that's being written to another file, because in fact, this console, this terminal is just, from the operating system's perspective, just another file. Uh, and then finally calling f and close. So this is just to illustrate there's a lot of stuff that the operating system is is doing in order to kind of get even a simple program up and running. Are these memory addresses that say, like, what are those? And are they virtual memory addresses or are those actually the physical ones? Uh, you mean this yeah. here? Uh, these are the virtual okay. memory addresses. Other questions? So in which, which case we interact with the actual physical address in memory? Uh, so we'll get to this uh, in, in several weeks. Um, but when a memory access occurs, it's there, this functionality is shared between the hardware and the operating system. But that address is translated into a physical address, which is then of sent on to the hardware uh, to retrieve some data from, from memory. So uh, at the level of these system calls, uh, these memory accesses are still using virtual uh, addresses which are being translated uh, to the physical address. Because all of these system calls are in the context of this particular process that I was running. So it has its private address space, that corresponds to some, or maybe multiple separate chunks of physical memory. And so that translation, we're, we're not seeing it here. Other questions? All right. All right, so let's do a bit of overview of the course. So, make this bigger. So, uh, there is a Moodle for the course uh, there, uh, we'll, uh, but the actual kind of organizational, uh, main organizational hub for the course is the course webpage, which is linked from the Moodle. Uh, there's a course calendar, uh, which lays out the topics, uh, assignments, and deadlines for the whole term. So, uh, for example, you can see that Lab Zero, uh, a, a quick introductory lab to uh, get you set up to do uh, to do the following labs, is out today and is due at 9 p.m. on Monday. Uh, all the labs uh, after this lab zero and the final project, you will be able to do with a partner should you choose. Uh, you can also ask to be matched with a partner if you don't have a partner already in mind. Uh, and that information, uh, as well as other information to help me make uh, the course better, uh, collected via the introductory survey that's on Moodle. So please fill that out by uh, 9 p.m. Friday. Uh, most topics uh, will have assigned reading, which will be shown on the calendar. Uh, these will usually be uh, 
parts from the free online textbook operating systems three easy pieces. Um, a, a few of them will be readings from uh, a different book, and they will be like today's in the form of scans uh, from that book. And sometimes this uh, uh, Anderson and Dahlin book uh, is better than the DO step one. And uh, each day there will be posted uh, notes uh, or slides for that class. Uh, and the recordings will be posted usually a, a day or two after class uh, and will show up uh, as like a, a bullet point and, and a lecture recording uh, beneath that day on the calendar. Uh, there will also be uh, quizzes uh, most weeks of the course. Uh, these will either be due on Friday or Wednesday. Uh, they move around just to avoid having multiple things due on the same day when I can. Uh, they will be online, untimed, unlimited attempts, uh, quizzes, and they're a way for you to kind of check your understanding, make sure that you're kind of keeping up with the material. Uh, so we'll have this introductory lab, we'll have the quizzes, uh, and then uh, we'll have five uh, labs um, uh, throughout the course. Uh, and these will all build on top of this kind of uh, minimal functional operating system called OSV that was uh, developed by folks at the University of Washington. Uh, and so in Lab Zero, you will clone the Git repository uh, for this code base, and you will, that is the code base you will kind of be progressively building out uh, throughout the term. Uh, and once, if you decide to, uh, there'll be more information about kind of configuring uh, uh, that repository to work with a partner and to uh, get any updates that I make to the, uh, uh, the, the initial code kind of throughout the term. Those instructions will be in lab zero or lab one. Uh, lab zero is just about getting the code and then doing a little bit of uh, debugging to, uh, with, with GDB. Uh, just to kind of get us all uh, refreshed on, on how to use GDB. It's gonna, going to be likely a very useful tool this, this term. Uh, the last uh, part of uh, greater work will be uh, the final project. No exams uh, in this course. Uh, so the final project is uh, what we'll conclude with. Uh, and this will be of uh, a project of your own design, you'll propose some extension to OSV uh, and implement it and implement tests for it. Uh, and that will be the, the final project for the course. More information about that uh, as, as uh, the time approaches. Questions so far? Sorry, is reading to the day of the lecture is on the day? Uh, so, the reading, uh, I think it will be helpful to have done the reading before uh, you come to class, um, but at the same time, I, uh, I will not assume you have read all of the reading and understood uh, every bit of it. Uh, so I think the reading can also be a useful review tool after class, so I would encourage you to use it in uh, whatever way uh, works best for you. Uh, potentially, uh, I mean, what we know about how people learn is that kind of uh, spaced repetition uh, really helps kind of uh, solidify new material, so you might also think about uh, doing the reading um, not right before, like leaving some space between when you do the reading and, and class. Uh, I think that that um, that could be helpful as well. Uh, one other thing I should mention about labs two through five is that there will be a design component. So uh, part of my goal for this this class is that you uh, start to think about uh, developing software in a more systematic way. And this is going to include writing something down before you start coding. So uh, labs two through five will have a design document component where uh, you will turn in 
uh, a design document after the lab is, is posted, uh, and then I will be putting you in groups of about four people, uh, which I'll call design pods, and you'll be sharing your design documents with your design pod, and then you will be responsible for uh, giving feedback on uh, your podmates' design documents as a way to kind of collaborate, see other people's ideas. Um, part of the design documents will be kind of listing unanswered questions so you can work together on, on figuring those out. Uh, and so there'll, there'll be this design component. Uh, other kind of administrative stuff uh, for the course. Uh, 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 four late days to use throughout the term. These are uh, 24 hour uh, extensions. Uh, to a given deadline, you can use them for the, the quizzes uh, or the labs. You cannot use them on the final project because it's due the last day of exams. Uh, you just email me. I'm going to use the late day. You can use, one of, you can use them one at a time as needed. Um, uh, no penalty for, for doing so. Uh, another kind of important uh, point on the course webpage uh, is inclusivity. And it has a paragraph, but for that, it's, you all belong here. I'm glad you're here. We're all going to learn a lot together. All right. So uh, one, uh, I think what I'll, oh, I said what I would end with is hopefully the laptop battery will cooperate. But I wanted to show you uh, my attempt from a few years ago to uh, answer the question, what is an operating system? Learn to code online in less than a year. Maybe, oh, it gave up. <laughs> <laughs> What is an operating system doesn't really have a single useful answer. Too many different kinds of software fall under that label. Your computer and your... <laughs> have an operating system, but so does your car, your television, even your microwave. Anything you use that includes a computer also includes an op. <laughs> Alright, this is, I encourage you, <laughs> about four and a half minutes, uh, I think you'll enjoy it, uh, but that will, that will be all for today. I'm uh, excited to talk a lot about operating systems for the term. Uh, stay warm, and I'll see you on Friday. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric.